All right, so we're lucky. I was really pleased when I, I met Sumac in Maryland, and she gave me a, a brochure. Connecticut. Connecticut? Connecticut. Oh, I thought it was Maryland. No, it was Connecticut. Thank you so much for that little memory. <laughs> it was at a place I was teaching at, and um, so she gave me her card, told me a little bit about her games, and then gave me the brochure, and then when I had spare time, I went and looked it up because I tend to do my research. I really liked what I saw. Someone who was in agility early on, you know, I wrote the second book on training agility in, in the U.S., and I, I really loved what it could do, but I did not like where I saw it going, especially for the average um, dog owner. Because my people had a blast and had a lot of fun, and we kept dogs safe and made it really enjoyable. And then it became something very much more serious and competitive. So I've said for years there, there should be some games that are fun and challenging and have some real merit. Um, and so I really liked what, what Sumac had to, to offer. So when she said she was coming, I was like, Maybe just maybe I can convince you to do it and see because not that you know there's many serious competitors here who've got you know buku titles under their belt. That's not what it's for. It's for can you take this home and consider this might be a really wonderful class, um, an offering for your pet owners. Not everybody wants to compete. Not everybody has a dog that's even suitable. But it doesn't mean the dog can't work with the person, have some fun challenges, and really enjoy the relationship. So, mm -hmm. take it away, Shemak. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I was very flattered to be asked to bring it, so it was great. I just wanted to get out of teaching for a couple hours. There you go. <laughs> Works for me. Works for me. Um, so, what inspired Waggett Games, just to tell you where it came from, was uh, students asking what can they do next after they've taken basic obedience classes with you, basic manners sort of classes. And maybe even if, maybe if you don't offer agility, because you know a lot of people see agility, it gets a lot of requests. Or maybe it's not for them. Maybe it's not for their dog. Um, if you look at the demographics of agility today, a lot of people wearing metal in the ring. <laughs> um, a lot of people not able to move as well as maybe they'd like. Dogs maybe not appropriate for it, or shouldn't be doing it. Um, and it might. I started in formal obedience at 13 and been there, done that, bored with it. So, and, and I just find, I don't know about you folks, but teaching formal obedience classes doesn't get a big draw amongst pet dog owners uh, in our area at all. So um, I wanted something that was good for pet dog owners. I also wanted something that was both a training program with major variety. That was key because, um, your students come, if you have eight students in a class, you may have eight different reasons why they're there. So I wanted a lot of variety for the student. The other thing I wanted was um, when Agility started, it was run by clubs. And now most trials, at least in New England, are run by businesses. So they're big, you know, 400 runs a day. That takes a lot to run a trial. And that's a small trial in, in some places in New England. Um, that's a one ring trial. Um, that's really hard to put on for a, a small training facility. So I also wanted something where um, I envisioned small training facilities and maybe you're an hour from another training facility because people aren't going to drive and probably set up tents for this. You know, They're going to drive to the neighboring facilities if they want to enter a little trial. The other thing is, since there's six, the, the brochure says there's seven, but we combined one of the divisions, so there's six divisions in it. Um, you could decide on a Friday evening after class, you're going to run a snippet trial. And it could be two hours long. And it could be 10 people if you wanted it to be. Or you can run a big event. Um, everything, if you were running it in a competition, could be run be a little bigger than this tent. My, my training ring, uh, when we do shows, is 50 by 65. You can run a, a complete show. Other than water skills, because I don't have that in that ring, <laughs> um, you can run it in that size space. Um, I've been inspired, and I don't, wanna, I don't want people to think I created this from scratch. I've been inspired by many other dog sports. Freestyle. Um, the, first, the first skill division I created is called shadow skills. Um, I am a rally judge, uh, APDT rally judge. I love rally. Um, However, I wanted more diversity, and I was hearing from especially people with either veterans' dogs or dogs with some issues. There's a lot of sits sometimes. It can be really hard on a dog's body. Um, so what we did, we made it a little more real world. Dogs work on both sides. So that allowed us to put in handling maneuvers like you would use in agility, except you're not running. Um, uh, so we have rear crosses. We have what we call a flying change. We have spins on each side. At the maximum in a, in a trial, there are three stationary exercises. That's it. So it's sort of like a dance. Uh, you're out there. You're moving. 
Um, one video I just posted on YouTube this week, we had a trial last weekend with this dog that has done rally, has done agility, has done a lot of things, and this dog typically stresses in the ring and she's been trying to work the dog through it. She does the first two stations, I think it is, and then she comes to wrap around the handler, which is the handler stops their motion and the dog goes around them, and you can see the light bulb go on in the dog's head. This is Wagged Games, this isn't that other stuff. The rest of that run, the dog is practically leaping in the air playing with her. Mm -hmm. And it was so fun to see that it epitomized what I wanted Wagged Games to be. So shadow skills, lots of twists and turns, healing on both sides. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna give you after we, I'm just gonna give you a brief thing, then I'm gonna get you out there doing some stuff. And if you don't have a dog with you, pair up with a person. Not on the equipment, but pair up with a person for the other thing, you can still do it. Um, and we do a lot of things like that in our classes. That's the other thing. Classes, um, we have a few requirements. Um, I do teach instructors courses because I do want to have, there's a standard. It has to be positive reinforcement for both. This I'm, I'm so big on this, not just for the dog. It has to be positive reinforcement for the humans. If you believe in the philosophy for dogs, you believe in it for people. Um, and so you have to use it. So somebody does the first time we have an exercise called back away. And no matter how I explain it, I can almost guarantee half the people are going to do it one way and half people are going to do it another way the first time. So, you know, say uh, three people do it perfectly, they get chocolate. You know, I reinforce with chocolate. Yeah, good job, they get chocolate. We keep, and Scooby Snacks. I had a student who told me about these little, they look like dog biscuits, but they're honey graham crackers. Oh my God, they're awesome. So we give out Scooby Snacks. Um, so it ha that's the reason I certify instructors is because I want to make sure that that standard is kept. Um, so we have shadow skills. Then we have what you're seeing mostly over there is what's called no need for speed obstacle skills. Long name, but I couldn't figure out a way to say it without it sounding like agility. Um, it's all sorts of challenging equipment and behaviors. Everything involves they're working with an item, but they range from picking up something and putting it in a bucket, uh, riding a scooter, going up the bridge and down the other side. Um, and there's, there's criteria to be met on all of it. Now, if the dogs are doing a serpentine through the hoops, can they run through the hoops? Sure. You know, if you do have an agility dog, they're probably not going to do that serpentine at a walk. Um, but you cannot link stations together with a run. It has to be. You're only judged on the station. The other thing in shadow skills Actually, in most all the venues, and I'll, I can give you, or more, most all the divisions, um, I always, always, always support the dog. So you can come into the ring at any time with treats or a toy in your pocket. Um, in shadow skills, you're only allowed to reward at the completion of a stationary. It's very moving, so it really doesn't allow for treats, but. If at any point in time you decide you need to go to treats or toys, you do it. It just becomes a training run. We have that right on a score sheet. It's market, oh, training run. You train out there. Years ago, there used to be matches. I don't know about here. There's no matches anymore. Yeah, there's no matches. We were young. And when we didn't have metal. Yeah. Yeah. And you could train them in a trial setting, and now you can't. So we always support that, even in our agility. You can bring toys and treats in the ring, and at any point, say your dog does beautiful, what, well, you can't really see the ramps that are going sideways on those steps. In our agility venue, those steps go the other direction. That's what we would, I, we call it our speed bump. That's our mini dog walk. And it's this wide. I don't want to see a Bernice Mountain Dog trying to run on a board that thick, you know. So, and they don't usually run it. You know, usually people walk it. But again, if you have an agility dog, sometimes getting them to walk that slow is a little more challenging. Um, so say your dog goes right down to the bottom of it beautifully or does the sway bridge for the first time in a trial and you want to bring out toys or food and reward the dog, you do it. And in um, Wagget Games, uh, no need for speed, you are only judged on the station so you can play with the dog any time between stations. You can pet the dog. I've been known to get down on the floor with my dog. Um, you can feed the dog anything between stations. Um, the dog ball. Probably most of you have heard of tri ball. Okay, um, tri ball is a cool sport that came over here. Um, again, though, what I was finding by looking at tri ball, you need a really big space. It's done in about the size of a soccer field. Oh, and in Europe, you probably see a lot more of tri ball. You need about the size of a soccer field, and I can already see here it's going to get serious. Like, you know, and again, oh, no, there's not, and there's nothing the matter with that. You know, I don't want to try to mix people who want to go get an arch with people who want to do that. They're not usually the same personality type. We need both. Um, so, 
Um, we took uh, the idea of working with yoga balls and we just changed it. Ball size is decided by the handler. If you want sand in the ball or not, that's up to you. Inside on a hard floor, I can tell you, if you don't have sand in the ball and your dog gives it a good doink and it bounces off the walls, it's, you know, makes it much harder. So, um, and at the novice level, I've got maps for you of what it looks like. They take it, I don't know if anyone here has done Northeast Border Collie Association herding, and I don't know AKC herding. They take the dog, you walk with the dog, with the, the dog moves the ball, you can back up. Dog pushes the ball through two sets of gates and puts it in a pen. And that's your novice level. You may treat through the whole time. Every time the dog pushes the ball, if you want to give him a treat, if you want to have him sit, lots of impulse control. When I teach it online, the dogs don't even touch the ball for the first six weeks. There's lots of impulse. The ball is there, but they don't work it yet. Um, the, um, and then we have uh, our agility, the A-frame, and as you can see on the speed bump there, even though it's not set up as a speed bump, that's the angle of the contact. Most of you probably know that the average pet dog person does not train contacts, and if they do, they don't train them well um, or safe for the dog. So we made everything so they really don't need a contact performance. All they need to do is smoothly go over the piece of equipment. Um, we don't want them leaping off of, you know, the top of it sort of thing. Our A-frame is only a five foot high piece, well, not five foot high, it's five foot plank. Uh, same width as a regular A-frame, set like this. I didn't bother to bring it because we weren't going to do agility. Set like this. So again, there's like, the dogs aren't going to miss the contact zone. That's how we set it. We ran a lot of dogs or had a lot of dogs go over it um, and they weren't missing it. Um, jump height is based on the dog's height at the elbow, so it's leg length, not withers, because we see too many really thick, I'm thinking of those labs, thick bodied labs that the proportion is not 50-50 and they're, real, they're jumping the height of their back, not the height length of their leg. Um, our maximum jump height is really low, um, well the maximum is 20 inches and nobody really does it. Um, and um, we also changed our agility thing because also the thing you hear a lot is, well, I don't have a border collie, so I'm not going to really be able to be competitive in agility. Um, we only have two ribbon divisions in our agility venue, small dog and big dog. Um, because what we found also, since again, these are average pet dog owners and they're not trying to work at the speed of light, um, the bigger dogs have to make bigger corners usually, and the, the times were really not that different. I mean, they weren't outrageous, and in a small space, we have less obstacles. Um, we have flower pots under our jumps. We have leaves and everything wrapped around them. There, it's, it looks like this. It looks pretty when you look at our agility course. Um, so we did that. Um, our water skills is the handler may walk. The dogs must wear a life jacket and they actually do a course like in shadow skills. They have to do spins beside you, 180s, what we call front crosses. Um, they where, do where's the water? At a lake, usually. <laughs> oh. But we don't care where you do it. I can imagine, like, do you just flood the training room? We do, we do. I'm working on a hot tub. It's going to be crowded in there, though. Um, I was like, I was having trouble picturing that one. It's going to be a new version of 101 things to do with a box, 101 things to do in a hot tub. Um, so. It could be. <laughs> so um, we run a camp each year over Labor Day weekend in New Hampshire. I run a kids camp and we run water trials there. And, you know, if you have access to a lake or, or pool, you know, you can do it. But the handlers usually want to walk. They can swim, but it's much easier to direct your dog walking. Um, the other program we have that is not allowed in water skills or in our agility venue is called Heart Dog Program. I wanted everybody to be able to compete. We have a tripod dog. We have dogs that have had um, TPLO, whatever. They have various <laughs> injuries that they've had uh, taken care of. Um, and say they can't do the steps. They don't have to do the steps. What they do is they apply to, not the host, they apply to, uh, to me at this point, um, to get approved to be a heart dog, which I can't imagine I would turn anyone down. And then I write up the criteria and it says, okay, this dog, cannot do the steps, this dog can't sit, they'll do a halt and stand, they tell me what they want to do instead. Or they can't do the steps so they'd like to do an extra item on the course that they can do. They are still judged, they're judged on those items that they do, but they don't compete against the other people. So they still earn points, they still earn titles, and in our place our ribbons are different colors for every skill, and our cues are ribbon, different colors for every skill, so it's colorful like this, and then the heart dogs get a little heart uh, pendant on their ribbon um, as well. 
because we want to, I mean, how many people have dogs that have done a lot of things and can't anymore because they've lost a leg and the handler and the dog still love doing it. So we always make them, uh, we make it accessible no matter what. So would you take blind dogs? Absolutely. Blind, deaf. The only thing in classes, we discourage reactive dogs. And the reason we discourage reactive dogs in class is because I think that's a different class. Mm -hmm. And you made a good point when you, you know, what, what I think is if you have uh, several reactive dogs in the class or even one reactive dog in the class, the other people may all have to be thinking about that dog and then they're not getting as much out of the class. So it's, it's not about the, that dog, it's about the class setting. So, um, and we are going to, in the process of setting up uh, video competing, so anyone who has a dog that can't go to a trial can do it at home and videotape it and send it in. And that'll have a V in the title is all. Our titles are really fun. They go like WAG1 and we have Master WAG and, you know, we have all sorts of fun, silly things. Um, so what I'd like to do, um, any questions on any of that part? And I have, fla I have handouts and stuff for you. Yes? For the reactive dogs, do you have some kind of thing that they can do before maybe coming to the class? Like a different to me, that would be whatever the facility wants to. I don't, I don't delve into that area, so I would say, you know, like when a dog is in our basic manners class or in puppy class, because we'll take dogs into this right out of puppy class, because um, we just adjust anything that would be not great for them. Um, I would say, you know, you need to either do some privates with me and work on the reactivity or we don't, at the moment, I don't have an instructor that's teaching. I find teaching a reactive dog class is really hard to teach because you, they all, you get five reactive dogs in a room and it's really reactive. Um, so, um, you know, we just kind of deal with that separately. And that's up to each facility. So I don't delve into that. They can come work with Suzanne. Um, I also brought you, uh, f in the handouts, I brought you some fly. Oh, I didn't mention Sniff It. I digress. All right, I'm going to go back. Sniff it. Um, you've all heard of canine nose work, too, another sport that's really been taking off. Again, a sport that's, that's pretty serious, and, and that's cool. So what we did was we took canine nose work, the idea of it, and various scent things, and we came up with um, Sniff It. First, the first thing is there's uh, two lines of five containers sitting out there. One has a, a food in it, a food treat that you bring, you supply the container and the food treat. Um, and then you release the dog to go search for it. And when the dog has found the correct one, the handler must raise their hand and then the judge will say if it's correct or not. If it's not correct, the handler still can work the dog so the dog can get a positive end and be rewarded for it. And the handler goes out and rewards the dog at the item. So again, we're supporting the dog. So that's one of the classes. The other class, and I didn't set them up yet because they're going to blow all over the place, but we use kids' pop-up houses and they're really funny and I can show you them. But so it's much more fun than like searching in boxes and searching around household equipment. So it looks really fun. In the second level, they search uh, the same thing, two lineups of uh, five, and it's an item with a handler scent on it and they have to identify that, and then they lurk, lurk in the pop-up tents for one of five uh, that has the handler scent on it. And the most advanced level, um, it's both. So they have to do a food and a um, handler scent. Um, so what I'd like to do is get you all up doing some stuff. I brought you sample courses so you could see what it looks like in a, um, you know, if it was in a trial because it's easy for me to show you what it looks like in a class. But so you can see maps of what it looks like in a trial. I put one of the Sniff It uh, score sheets in there because it kind of shows the pop-up houses and stuff. Because one of the problems we have as a judge when you're judging Sniff It, you've got 10 containers out there with food in it. And by the time you've judged about the fifth one, you turn around, what container did I put that in? Mm -hmm. And so we have a little thing and you circle the one you put it in while you put it out there so that you don't, because otherwise you don't know how to tell the handler if they're right or not. Handler doesn't know. So, um, so we have that. So you can see a little what it looks like. Our times are very generous, by the way, and anything. The only reason we have maximum course times is if it's gone that far, that long, something's really going wrong. Um, that's the only reason they're there. The other thing, if you do any other sports, the gates, ring gates are always closed. Having had to write up three dogs in rally, two of which have been banned, I don't want to see dogs coming out of the ring. Closing the ring gate just eliminates that a little more. So, um, so if you want to, we can go play. All right, let's go play.